It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you for having me. Uh, my talk will be a little bit different than the average talk here at the Lifelong Learning um, presentations in one respect because I'm not a scientist. And a lot of presentations are presenting data. Scientists are trying to figure out some aspect of the world, and so they present evidence or data for a particular theory or thesis or hypothesis. I'm a philosopher. We don't get white coats. They don't let us near the lab equipment. So I'm not here to present any data to you. I'm not here to, to give an empirical presentation. Instead, I'm going to do what a philosopher does best, which is to try to help us think about the concepts that we use and the ways that we try to figure out the world and what's in it. And in particular, what I want to argue is that a, a distinction that's being taught to school children, a distinction between facts and opinions, is a confusing distinction. And furthermore, it's not just an innocuous confusion, but it's one that's harmful too. So I think that we're doing school children in our country a disservice by teaching them to think in this particular way. And I hope to convince you of that by the end of the talk. My talk will go less than an hour because I want to leave plenty of time for interchange between the two of us because that's when the philosophical magic really happens. So I want to start by putting some context to my talk. Um, and the context comes from C.S. Lewis. He wrote a book titled The Abolition of Man. And the opening essay in that, in that book is entitled Men Without Chests. And I want to read for you the first sentence of that essay. Lewis writes, I doubt whether we are sufficiently attentive to the importance of elementary textbooks. And he goes on to write about a particular view that was popular in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s in Anglo-American uh, Anglo philosophical circles, a view called emotivism in ethics. And he tries to argue that teaching that to children is a, has a really bad idea. Well, like Lewis, I have a similar concern. I think that we should pay attention to the kinds of things that we're teaching our elementary and middle school children when it comes to how they think about philosophy in general and in ethics in particular. And this story starts when I walk into my third grade son's classroom. These two signs were hanging above his chalkboard at an open house. I walked in, and as a philosopher, I read those two signs, and I said, yeah, well, what if you believe something that's true? Now what do you have? Is that a fact, or is that an opinion? So I, I snapped a picture of it with my phone, and I went to talk to the teacher, and I said, so, what, you know, what's up with this? She says, well, it turns out that Distinguishing between facts and opinions is a reading skill that is required by Common Core curriculum. And in fact, it was around long before that. So this is not something that was new with Common Core. This has been a, a reading strategy that's been offered to American uh, elementary and middle schoolers for years and years and years. So I went home and I did a little research. And it turns out she was right. So there's all of this curriculum and all of these standards about uh, teaching kids to distinguish between facts and opinions. And they define those two concepts slightly differently. Some places define facts just as claims that are true and proven, not true and provable. But by and large, the definitions for opinions are the same. To have an opinion is to think something, to feel something, or to believe something. So I found out that this is a, a, a real thing, something that was um, being taught and tested across, uh, across the, the country. So I wrote up a little, um, this is a little strange that it became an opinion piece, but I wrote up a little opinion piece <laughs> on why I thought this was a really bad idea. And I sent it to the New York Times. They published it, and it created uh, what we would call in Georgia a hubbub. And since then, uh, you know, I've, been, I, I've had a, a chance to interact with a lot of educators who are really interested in this idea, some of whom agree with me that this turns out to be a bad idea some of whom want to defend that particular distinction. And in my talk, what I want to do is three things. First, I want to make really clear why I think this distinction is confusing. And then second, I want to try to convince you that this, confu this confused distinction is also harmful. And lastly, I want to just briefly indicate a way that I think we should move going forward, a way to do it better. 
So let's start with why this distinction, a fact, something that's true and can be proven, opinion, what someone thinks, feels, or believes, why is that confusing? Well, here's the first reason that it's confusing. It's confusing because those are not logically exhaustible categories. This, of course, was my first reaction when I see the sign. What happens if you believe something that's true and provable? If I tell you that there are red things and I tell you that there are cube-shaped things, that's fine. You'll be able to sort things into red and cube things. But if you get a red cube, you'll be genuinely confused if your teacher asks you to put it into one category or the other. A red cube is both a red thing and a cube-shaped thing. And so it makes no sense to say that it has to be one or the other, but not both. So this distinction between facts and opinions is not exhaustive. I believe that Washington was the first president of the United States. I think that's true. I think it's provable in the sense that there's evidence of that, but it's also something that I think, it's something that I believe. I'm not sure if I feel it or not. I don't know what it would mean to feel that, but it's something I believe. So does that make it an opinion of mine, or does that make it a fact? I want to say it makes it both. So if we ask kids to separate these things into two categories that have no overlap, we're asking for trouble. What we need is a, a distinction that's logically exhaustible. There are things you believe, things that you don't. There are things that are true, there are things that are not. There are things that you have evidence for, there are things that you have no evidence for, and so forth. Those would be exhaustive categories. But as it stands, fact versus opinion, the way it's being defined in schools, those are not exhaustible categories. There are worse problems. This must be a fun bumper sticker because I see it all the time. How old would you be if you didn't know how old you are? Well, the answer is you're just as old as you were when you knew it, right? Whether you know it or not has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not it's true. Knowing something is one thing. It's being true is a different thing. And we shouldn't conflate those two different positions. Philosophers would say this is confusing metaphysics, the way things really are, with epistemology, our grasp of the world or, or how we think about the world. And this distinction between facts and, and opinions makes this confusion as well. When we teach kids that facts are things that are true and proven or true and provable, we're blending that distinction between the way the world is and the way we see the world, our perspective on it, our knowledge of the world. There are plenty of facts that we're not in a position to confirm or ascertain or prove. The number of the stars in the universe is even or it's odd. I don't know. There's a fact of the matter. None of us know. There's a fact as to how many hairs there are on my head. I don't know what it is. There's a fact as to whether King David was left-handed. I have no idea whether he was or not, but there is a fact of the matter. So to claim that something is a fact only when it's proven, or that it's a fact only when it's provable, is to blur that line between the way the world is and the way we see the world. And I think that's a very serious confusion. Think of what scientists do. Think about what doctors do. Think about what juries do. They try to discover the facts. They don't make things facts or determine the facts. The facts are out there before the doctor steps in the room. The facts are out there when the jury is seated. Their job is to try to gather evidence to, tr to determine what that fact is, but it doesn't somehow become a fact once they've unearthed the evidence. So that's the second confusion. But a, a third way I think this distinction is confusing is because, for lack of a better way of putting it, it fetishizes the notion of proof. If you take just about any intro science class here at Fort Lewis College, the scientists who teach those classes will be very careful to tell you that science doesn't trade in proofs. Science can't prove particular things. Science gathers evidence. They confirm hypotheses, disconfirm hypotheses, but scientists are typically really careful not to use the word proof. And I think that's a really good thing. I think we should banish this notion of proof from our vocabulary. And the reason we should banish it is because it's ambiguous. Sometimes somebody means something by proof that's really, really strong. 
standards of which are never met. And other times when people use the concept of proof, what they really mean is something like reason or evidence. To, have, to prove something is to have some evidence for its being the case. So there's a weak notion of proof and a strong notion of proof. And then what we do, being humans, we invoke the version of proof that we want to help us with our own particular ends. You a conservative? Well, of course we haven't proven climate change, right? There's lots of studies out there, but all of those studies fall short of proof that pollution is contributing to climate change. You liberal? Well, of course there's no proof that raising the minimum wage cuts job numbers, right? There are studies that show that sometimes that happens, but those studies fall short of proof. What we end up doing is we use this notion of proof as a kind of rhetorical bludgeon to get our way in debates. And really, again, when we teach students that facts are things that are proven or provable, we're inviting confusion about what kind of things amount to proof and thus what kind of things amount to facts. That's bad. And here's the last one. <laughs> For my money, this is actually the worst problem. But the, the way this is most, I mean, imagine driving along seeing this sign. You'd be like, really? This idea that facts are things that are true and proven, or, or facts are things that are true and provable, I think that view is self-refuting. So here's what a philosopher means when she says self-refuting. A view is self-refuting when it has this unfortunate property. If the view is true, that entails that it's false. That's really bad. If you ever hold a view such that if you're right, you're wrong, that's bad. And I think this idea that facts are claims that are true and proven or true and provable, I think this smacks of a view that's self-refuting. And here's why. Just consider this claim. A claim is true only if it's empirically provable. Is that claim empirically provable? What would a scientific test look like if you wanted to confirm? I mean, is there litmus paper? That, I don't know. Is this true? Let's dip it and find out. And you look. It is true, right? This is, not a, this is not an empirically provable claim. So if we want to assert that claims are true only if they're empirically provable, that test must apply to that claim itself. And if that claim fails the test, then it's not true. So I think this idea that facts are things that are true and proven or provable, I think that's the kind of view where if you think it's true, you're committed to also thinking that it's false. And that's a bad thing. So I gave you four reasons for thinking that this distinction between facts and opinions as it's being taught in, in schools is confusing. But not all things that are confusing are harmful. Lots of us endorse confusing ways of looking at the world that work out just fine for us, that aren't harmful in any way whatsoever. I think this particular confusion, though, is pernicious. So in this next part of the talk, I'll try to explain why I think this confusion between facts and opinions is harmful. And I want to start with a test question that my son actually had in class later when I knew to start paying attention to uh, facts and opinions in his homework. So he was asked, which of these four things is a fact? I'll read them to you. Option A, wild animals are really shy. Option B, deer only feel safe with good hiding places nearby. Option C, a screech owl's feathers are the color of tree bark. D, deer are the wariest of all wild animals. Now, my poor son, having a philosopher for a father, <laughs> he marked B. He thought it was a fact that deer only feel safe with good hiding places nearby. And you can see that he got this one wrong. And furthermore, the right answer is that screech owl's feathers are the color of tree bark. <laughs> they, might, they might be. I'm not denying that that's a fact. <laughs> but here's the worry. The worry is this distinction between fact and opinion 
undercuts or undermines the ability of science to answer scientific questions. I think it's just an open question, for example, whether deer feel safe with good hiding places nearby. Certainly there are certain brain patterns that are emitted when deer feel comfortable or, or when they feel safe. It's an empirical study that one could run to find out whether deer feel a certain way. And so this first reason I think this distinction is harmful is because I think it doesn't do science and our scientists, the, it doesn't give them the credit that they deserve. Here's some other examples, by the way, of things that count as opinions and not facts according to common core standards. Vegetarians are healthier than non-vegetarians. You think that's true? Eh, sorry, it's an opinion. Thank you for your opinion. Your parents would like this camping spot. No facts there, just an opinion. The pilgrims believed they would be free in the new world. Again, it's an opinion. Cable TV is expensive. Now you know people haven't paid for cable TV if they put that on there. <laughs> Clearly a fact if ever there were one. All of these are empirical issues. Vegetarians are healthier than non-vegetarians. All right, fine, let's define healthy. Do you mean lives the longest? Do you mean has the lowest cholesterol? Do you mean spends less time in the hospital? Let's define the criteria for what counts as healthy, and let's get scientists to do a study to find out whether vegetarians are on the whole healthier or not. We can do that. We don't need to dismiss it as an opinion and say there's no fact of the matter and move on. Science can answer this. Your parents would like this camping spot. Well, if your parents have preferences, we can find out what those preferences are and try to figure out whether the camping spot meets the preferences or doesn't meet the preference. This is not, as my brother-in-law from Georgia puts it, rocket surgery. <laughs> the pilgrims believed they would be free in the new world. Historical question. We'll go find out what the pilgrims wrote. We'll look at some of their documents. We'll find out whether they believed. Th these are all facts that are open to the investigation of science. So I think that when we teach kids that claims like these count as opinions, what we do is we undermine our ability to sort out and determine and establish some really important things that are open to scientific inquiry. We shouldn't be doing that for children. We should be showing them the depth of research that scientists can do to figure out people's preferences and their feelings and what they believed and so forth. So that's one problem. It's worse. <laughs> Who's the fairest of them all? A philosophical question, if ever there were one. What this fact-opinion dichotomy does for some of science, like the examples I just gave you, it does for all of philosophy. Now you can see why I'm ticked off. Every philosophical claim comes out an opinion according to the fact-opinion dichotomy. And that means every philosophical claim comes out as being something that's not true or provable, whatever that means. This includes matters of epistemology and, and matters of metaphysics, but it also importantly includes matters of ethics, too. So just like I gave you some examples that I found in my, student, in my, in my son's assignments about facts and opinions that related to science matters, check out these claims. These are all philosophical claims but they're all categorized as opinions in various common core assignments, testing the ability of students to notice the difference between opinions and facts. It's wrong to cheat in school. You only thought it was. It's an opinion. Some people think it is, some people think it's not. All men are created equal. Opinion, no, sorry, it's an opinion. You haven't gone through common core, it's an opinion. You know, there's no, there's, no, there's no fact of the matter. Um, some arguments are better than others. No, better. Better. I got in real trouble. I got in this debate with, with the teacher, my son's teacher at one point, because he got a question wrong, and, and he marked um, that it was true that ducks were good swimmers. And ducks are good swimmers, right? That's true. But no. The reason it was categorized as opinion, according to his teacher, is because the word good signals value and value signals opinion. And all opinions, remember, are not true. They're opinions. So some arguments are better than others. You might think so. There's no fact of the matter. People have free will, a, a, a philosophical view. Again, opinion. Now why is this a problem? 
you might think, yeah, so much the worse for philosophy. That's what John's thinking. Yeah, so much the worse for philosophy is why I got in biology. I didn't have to worry about that, right? Well, not so fast. First, I think lots of us actually do believe that there are at least some philosophical truths or at least some moral or ethical truths. At least someone in the audience, I hope, thinks that all men are created equal. At least someone in the audience thinks that racism is wrong. At least someone in the audience thinks that students have certain rights and responsibilities and so forth. If you think that any moral claim is true, then you can't think that this way of dividing up facts and opinions makes sense. But it's not just what we believe. It's also what we teach. I kid you not, the same classroom has a sign on the door. As kids are leaving the classroom, they see this, this little sign. It's got a pair of eyes on it. I should have taken a picture of this, too. It says, integrity matters. It's what you do when no one is watching. Now, you think that's a fact or an opinion? I mean, I just, I just want to go ask the teacher, how about that? Fact or opinion? It's your opinion. Keep it to yourself, right? No. Don't post signs that aren't true. My son had to sign a statement um, at the beginning of, of third grade showing that he recognized that other students had rights and that he had particular responsibilities. Hello, it's a value claim. Value claims aren't true. I mean, if he had really been a smart aleck, thank God he takes after his mother. If he had really been a smart aleck, he would have just written back on that form, none of these claims are true. Don't ask me to sign things that aren't true, right? Just give me the facts, lady. But lastly, not only, not only does this distinction uh, and, and sort of the sidelining of, of philosophy and value claims into the opinion camp, not only is it contrary to what a lot of us believe, not only is it contrary to what we're actually teaching our kids, but it has bad implications for how people actually act and behave. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I want to report to you about two recent studies that give some indication for how your beliefs about morality affect your behavior. In particular, there are two studies that test whether someone thinks of morality as a matter of fact or morality as a matter of opinion and then sees how they behave in the real world. Both of them were done in 2013. One of them tested whether or not people who were primed with one view of morality rather than the other gave differently in a charity experiment. So to prime a subject is to get them thinking about, make something salient to them so that they're thinking about it. We can say things like, did you know you're going to die someday? Hey, how, how, what do you think about this survey, right? And then we'll get them to respond on the survey. And the thought is thoughts of death will make them, you know, behave differently. Well, in this one study, there were uh, researchers on the streets of Boston, and they came up to passerbys, and they said, hey, do you think that, that morality is objective and there are facts about right and wrong and such and such? And then there would be a control group which doesn't get any question at all. Then there was a third group. And the third group, they say, you know, do you think that morality is just a matter of opinion and we make it up and nothing's true and nothing's really false? It's just a matter of preference. So there are three groups. The, group that, the, the group that saw morality as a fact were primed to think of morality as a fact. The control group, which got nothing than the group that was primed to think of morality as a matter of preference and opinion or whatever. And then, down the road, after the, you know, the person asking the question, down the road there were people asking for donations to various charitable causes, right? So the person who was primed to think that morality is this real thing would be asked for money. The control group people were asked for money. People who were primed to think of morality as a preference were asked for money. Any guesses on what happened? Who did? First group gave more, twice as much. So people who were just asked, they didn't even have to answer. They could have been like, no, I don't think morality is like that. Just being asked whether morality was a matter of fact and objective made them twice as likely to donate as people who were in the third group. Control group was somewhere in the middle. That's really interesting, especially if we're teaching kids to think that morality is all a matter of this third group, right? A matter of preference. Here's a second example. This one's even more stunning. You might think, oh, fine, so school kids won't donate to charities, not that big of a deal, at least they're not doing anything wrong. Oh, so in this study, 
college students were asked to come in and, and, and perform a little uh, a test on their ability to recall information out of a paragraph, where, of course, you already know, the experimenters didn't care at all about their ability to recall things out of the paragraph. They were going to give them specific paragraphs, right, just like this, this study. So this one was on female genital mutilation. Uh, this is female circumcision uh, that's practiced in, in certain countries. And one group would get the, do you know countries are doing this? Even though women have rights not to be treated in this way without their consent and so on and so forth. You know, and they had to read this paragraph and then do recall. The control group got some bland, I don't know what it was. It was just some description of like the forest or something. And then the third group got this, you know, well, countries do different things. People have different preferences. There's no one right way to treat people. You know, this kind of morality is all a matter of preference. And here's where it gets really clever. College students were doing this, and college students don't do anything without an incentive. So the incentive in this case were cash prizes. And the way you get a cash prize is by putting a, a certain number of raffle tickets into this big drawing. To find out how many raffle tickets you got to put into the drawing, at the conclusion of the experiment, you roll two 10-sided die, 0 through 9. Made it a little more difficult for them to calculate what's going on. And then they just report their number, right, at the end for how many tickets they get. You can all see where this is going, right? People who read about female genital mutilation and the thought that you know, women have rights and they haven't consented and so on and so forth, their reports on average right, were very close to what you would expect based on chance. Control groups, very close to what you would expect based on chance. And how about the third group? Any guesses? Magically, they got way more raffle tickets than anyone else. Their rates of cheating were more than twice what was expected based on just the systematic roll of the die. So I don't pretend that these two experiments you know, lock everything up. After all, there's no such thing as proof. But it does seem like that's pretty good evidence that the way you think about morality, whether you think about it as a matter of preference or, or a matter of fact, affects the way you behave. So insofar as you care about the behavior of others, you should care about this particular distinction that's teaching kids to think about ethics as solely a matter of preference. So that's the second way it's harmful. Here's the last. Suppose we do teach people that some of the stuff that we care most about, our political views, our religious views, our philosophical views, our ethical views, those are matters of opinion to which there is no fact to which are not susceptible to proof. What do you think we get in exchange? If there's no fact out there, if there's no right answer, if every opinion is just as good as any other, who do you think wins debates? Just think rhetorically. What, what happens in your mind when someone says, well, it's just your opinion? Conversation's over. That's why you use that terminology. To say, well, that's just your opinion, is to close the door on further conversation. There's nothing more to be said. You prefer that, I prefer this. Tomato, tomato, let's go our separate ways. Nothing more to talk about. So I think the third reason that this distinction between fact and opinion is, is, is so pernicious is that it teaches kids to sweep under the rug the really difficult issues and conversations that we ought to be having with one another. You're a Democrat, I'm a Republican, fine. Your opinion. Fake news anyway, right? You have your opinions, I have my opinions. How do you think we're going to settle these things? Not by reasoned discourse. There's no truth to figure out. And so I think in some sense we're reaping what we've sown at the political level. You can't teach kids that there's no fact of the matter or that nothing's provable or we can't make progress on these really hard issues in philosophy and ethics and so forth and then not expect that the loudest voice wins. So what do we do? I hope you're all now suitably depressed. <laughs> so where do we go from here? Suppose you're convinced that this is a really, a really poor way to go forward. I want to say two things on, on, on where we should go from here. First, we should just have clear logically exhaustive ways of defining the important terms. Facts are things that are true. 
Beliefs are things that you think. Evidence are reasons that connect the one to the other. Evidence are reasons to think that some belief or some claim or some proposition is true. That's it. There are facts. There are things you believe. Sometimes what you believe matches the facts. Sometimes it doesn't. Your best guide as to figuring out when they do is to look at the evidence. Notice in particular the word opinion is not up there. It does us no favors by handing children a rhetorical tool to shut down conversation. Notice the word proof is not up there. It does us no favors to teach kids to use the word proof in convenient ways to support things that they already think. It's much clearer just to talk about reasons and evidence. Second, there are some really good resources uh, available on how to have philosophical conversations with children, and in particular, ethical conversations with children. So I had a handout that I passed out earlier. It didn't make it to the back row. Back row, you'll have to email me. I'll send you one. Um, there are some really good resources out there about how to sit children down and have, have them lead a really productive discussion about how to think about ethical principles or moral principles, how to think about philosophical issues. This handout lists some websites. So for example, there is a, uh, a center for, for teaching philosophy for kids at the University of Washington in Seattle. They have an exceptional website, including a, a, a bibliography of over 100 children's books, plus discussions that you can lead uh, with children. So Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree, all of the philosophical questions that are raised by that, really interesting ways of getting children to identify philosophical issues and have thoughtful, rational conversations with one another and really engage in fruitful dialogue. And so that's my second suggestion. <coughs> Excuse me. We should take seriously the idea that we can do better, even when it comes to really young children, in inculcating careful thinking, philosophical thinking, and model for them the kind of discourse that we hope to see between adults and, in particular, in the political arena. So that's my talk. I think that it's a mistake to teach children uh, the distinction between facts and opinions in this particular way. It's a mistake because it's confusing. It's a mistake because it's harmful. And I think there are really clear ways in which we can do better. Thank you. <laughs>